Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. A game plan to replace this old dome. The best route from Minneapolis to Chicago. And how safe is your money? Those topics in this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. How financially sound are Minnesota's lending institutions? Four Minnesota banks have failed in 2009, and the overall health of the industry runs from questionable to very stable. Those were just some of the comments made at a recent hearing in the state capitol. The Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee probed members of the banking industry about the current and future conditions of lending institutions in the state and how those conditions are affected by the national economy. Here are some portions of that committee. The implication is that all delinquent loans are now somehow tied to this concept of risky lending. You can't draw that conclusion. You just can't. A perfectly underwritten loan can go bad. It's absolutely possible. You make a, a house loan, somebody's going to get a mortgage, a, a couple, a husband and wife both have great incomes. You look at that loan today and it looks like a great loan. It looks a lot different if one of the spouses loses their job, one of the spouses gets sick, one of the spouses dies. It looks very different. <coughs> a loan on a, a, to a real estate manager who operates a strip mall that is 100% occupied today it looks great. It cash flows perfectly, meets all of our underwriting criteria. It looks good. Two years from now when Starbucks pulls out of that strip mall and the shoe, shoe store closes and the little high-end boutique that sells fancy women's shoes goes out of business, that loan looks very different. That was not a risky loan. It's just a loan that went bad. I know you're not a regulator, but in the banks that are under the Minnesota Bankers Association, yes. would you think we've plateaued or trending down or as far as concern or anxiety or are we starting to push up toward the surface again? Um, the banks lag the other economic indicators. In other words, when we are on our way down, the, the community banks that I work with, the, the traditional banks in Minnesota, as our performance starts to go downward, it's because other indicators have already been on their way down. Yeah. We will also lag, slightly lag, the improvement indicators. So as soon as things, as soon as the general trends are up in consumer confidence and GDP and all the other things, we will slightly lag that recovery as well. Uh, so if you're asking me whether we're, at, we're whether we're at the bottom just yet, I hope we've hit bottom, but we're not. Um, we're not looking for a significant, uh, you know, uptick uh, in our banking world for at least another couple quarters. Joining me to give a little more perspective on that hearing and what it means for Minnesotans, we have the chair of the Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, Linda Scheid. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Let's talk again a little bit more about this hearing. Based on what you did here, would you say that Minnesota's lending institutions are financially sound? You know, it's hard to actually rate the soundness, but yes, I think one of the first thing we know is that people's money is safe. That it's the most important thing. And then I think it's important to know that our regulators in the Department of Commerce, the financial examiners, have a handle on where all of our banks rank. And we have a number of banks, I think it's a fifth or a sixth of the, our total banks, um, are on a watch list. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. Some may. We've had four state banks fail this year and one national bank. Um, well, and actually that was not this year. So. Yeah, that's we've come from zero, you know, to um, this number in Minnesota and zero in the country to a ninety some this year. And during that hearing, Senator Gerlach brought up a point. What happens once these banks are on the watch list? Is that something that you, as a legislator, should be watching a little more closely, or is it just kind of a case of letting the free market ride and, and just seeing what these banks can do to become more stable? One of the more interesting things that I learned, and it really was a learning session. It was a four-hour meeting and I did learn that there's information available and it's available to all of us, to the public, in terms of the quarterly reports that every bank has to submit um, across the nation. But that's available, it sounds like it's available about a month and a half after the report is submitted. It seems these quarterly reports. And I think that will give us an idea because that will show how, you know, the bad loans, it'll show 
what the assets and the liabilities are of the financial institution and we can kind of take it from there. I don't think, I don't know if the watch list is public, but Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. A game plan to replace this old dome, the best route from Minneapolis to Chicago, and how safe is your money? Those topics in this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. How financially sound are Minnesota's lending institutions? Four Minnesota banks have failed in 2009, and the overall health of the industry runs from questionable to very stable. Those were just some of the comments made at a recent hearing in the state capitol. The Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee probed members of the banking industry about the current and future conditions of lending institutions in the state, and how those conditions are affected by the national economy. Here are some portions of that committee. The implication is that all delinquent loans are now somehow tied to this concept of risky lending. You can't draw that conclusion. You just can't. A perfectly underwritten loan can go bad. It's absolutely possible. You make a, a house loan, somebody's going to get a mortgage, a, a couple, a husband and wife both have great incomes. You look at that loan today and it looks like a great loan. It looks a lot different. One of the spouses loses their job, one of the spouses gets sick, one of the spouses dies. It looks very different. <coughs> a loan on a, a, to a real estate manager who operates a strip mall that is 100% occupied today it looks great. It cash flows perfectly, meets all of our underwriting criteria. It looks good. Two years from now when Starbucks pulls out of that strip mall and the shoe, shoe store closes and the little high-end boutique that sells fancy women's shoes goes out of business, that loan looks very different. That was not a risky loan, it's just a loan that went bad. I know you're not a regulator, but in the banks that are under the Minnesota Bankers Association, yes. would you think we've plateaued or trending down or as far as concern or anxiety, or are we starting to push up toward the surface again? Um, the banks lag the other economic indicators, in other words, when we are on our way down, the, the community banks that I work with, the, the traditional banks in Minnesota, as our performance starts to go downward, it's because other indicators have already been 
on their way down. Yeah. We will also lag, slightly lag, the improvement indicators. So as soon as things, as soon as the general trends are up in consumer confidence and GDP and all the other things, we will slightly lag that recovery as well. Uh, so if you're asking me whether we're, at, we're whether we're at the bottom just yet, I hope we've hit bottom, but we're not. Um, we're not looking for a significant, uh, you know, uptick uh, in our banking world for at least another couple quarters. Joining me to give a little more perspective on that hearing and what it means for Minnesotans, we have the chair of the Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, Linda Scheid. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Let's talk again a little bit more about this hearing. Based on what you did here, would you say that Minnesota's lending institutions are financially sound? You know, it's hard to actually rate the soundness, but yes, I think one of the first thing we know is that people's money is safe. That it's the most important thing. And then I think it's important to know that our regulators in the Department of Commerce, the financial examiners, have a handle on where all of our banks rank. And we have a number of banks, I think it's a fifth or a sixth of the, our total banks, um, are on a watch list. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. Some may. We've had four state banks fail this year and one national bank. Um, well, and actually that was not this year. So. Yeah, that's we've come from zero, you know, to um, this number in Minnesota and zero in the country to a 90 some this year. And during that hearing, Senator Gerlach brought up a point. What happens once these banks are on the watch list? Is that something that you as a legislator should be watching a little more closely or is it just kind of a case of letting the free market ride and, and just seeing what these banks can do to become more stable? One of the more interesting things that I learned, and it really was a learning session. It was a four-hour meeting and I did learn that there's information available and it's available to all of us, to the public, in terms of the quarterly reports that every bank has to submit um, across the nation. But that's available, it sounds like it's available about a month and a half after the report is submitted. It seems, these quarterly reports. And I think that will give us an idea because that'll show how, you know, the bad loans, it'll show what the assets and the liabilities are of the financial institution and we can kind of take it from there. I don't think, I don't know if the watch list is public, but I know that um, the Department of Commerce is working with those banks to correct wherever they have inadequacies. I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, Mark Cummins from the Minnesota Credit Union Network said that they are struggling to find qualified borrows, borrowers. They have money to lend. And yet in a lot of media reports, you hear more about really tight credit and, and that there isn't a lot of credit available. Where do you, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I think just an awful lot of people have a lot of debt and it makes them not such a good risk. I, that has to be what's happening. You know, it wasn't really said in our hearing, but I get the idea from the, the individuals who have contacted me, friends of mine, people I know in my community who are having trouble or who, who are making all their mortgage payments, they'd like to rework their loan because maybe they've taken a pay cut to keep their job. Maybe somebody's lost one of their, you know, couple part-time jobs, whatever. They're going to be fine when the, when the economy turns around and they've always made their payments on time, they're having a hard time getting any modifications. And that is where I, f I wish that our lending institutions would be more aggressive about that. But that doesn't really speak to their soundness and the availability of credit. I just think that people are, str are maxed out on their credit cards and that, that hurts them when they go to get a loan. So given that theory, would it be a f safe assumption then that banks won't be lending out much more money anytime soon because it's going to take a considerable amount of time to pay off some of this debt? Is that a fair argument? Well, I think, I think that that's kind of the likely, the most likely scenario. But they do have money to loan when people are qualified. So I think a lot of first time home buyers people who are younger, who haven't accumulated debt, or people who just never you know, used a lot of credit cards and did pay their bills every 30 days, those people are gonna be able to get mortgages. And so from a consumer protection standpoint, would you as a lawmaker advocate perhaps loosening up on some of these regulations? And what would you, what would you propose? You know, I think we got into some of the mortgage trouble, some of the financial institution trouble by pushing too many people who really shouldn't have gotten loans into loans. We were so eager to promote home ownership, we forgot that 
people have to be able to make the payments. And um, so there was an awful lot of government urging in that direction. We really didn't discuss that in the hearing, but I think most people understand that's what happened. A lot of people got mortgages five, six, seven years ago that shouldn't have gotten mortgages. Um, so no, I don't, I'm not really interested in promoting loans for people who really shouldn't get them. I think this, the qualifying standards should, should stay strong, but I think that banks should be more willing to um, make adjustments, modifications for people to help them get through this tough time. Okay, Joe Witt from the Minnesota Bankers Association contends that regulated lenders do not engage in risky lending practices. Would you concur with this thought? Well, well you know, obviously they ended up with loans that turned out to be risky or riskier than they originally. I mean, lending is a risk in the first instance. I mean, th when you're loaning somebody money, you're counting on their being able to stay in their job, they're being able to sustain or grow their income and and move up. And that's kind of been the way we it's happened in the United States and people have started to earn more money and um, so they had adjustable rate mortgages and then people lost jobs or didn't get pay increases um, their mortgages adjusted out of where they were able to afford them so I don't um, so do you think the regulations the current regulations in place are sufficient yeah I really do I, I think that um, what they've said, what they said to us, and I thought it was an important point, is that a loan that looked good today, or that does look good today, can go south in two or three years if you or I lose our job, or we have a change in our life, or there's a significant medical problem in the family, whatever. Um, that all of a sudden changes it, and you, you can anticipate. That's why there's risk inherent in the business of lending money, but you can't really. Um, I don't think anybody predicted just how devastating the economy's turn, the downturn would be. So if I'm a Minnesotan and I do qualify for a loan, what are some of the things I should look for as I shop around for a loan? Are there certain regulations, certain things that we should see that are in place with an institution? In recent years, we've had significant legislation that will limit the kind of products, if you will. It's limited the riskier products. The um, adjustable rate loans have to be really more fairly disclosed. We aren't going to have interest-only loans. My goodness, some lenders put out loans that didn't even that didn't touch the principal where the principal grew on people so they may have owed you know 150,000 when they started and all of a sudden they they owe 160 175 um, that's crazy we've disallowed that kind of a product and it took legislation to do that and I want to say something else that I don't think it was our banks or our credit unions that engaged in those kinds of practices it is a rule that doesn't mean that no credit union or no bank ever made a riskier than they should have loaned. But a lot of that happened with mortgage brokers, um, people who are here today and gone tomorrow who made their commission and now they're out of town, they're gone. The fraud we've seen hasn't been through the banks, it's been through um, these practices of people who aren't regulated in the same way that the banks and credit unions are regulated. So we're just about out of time, but in all, you are comforted by what you heard? Well, I was first of all I was informed greatly informed and I thought the department did an outstanding job um, Commissioner Deputy Commissioner Murphy did an outstanding job of presenting um, the status of bank regulation in Minnesota and yes I, I, I wouldn't say comforted I know there's trouble and I know but I also have confidence that people's money is safe and people ought to feel that confidence as well all right Senator Scheid thanks so much for your time today thank you a revised game plan is unveiled with the goal of generating revenue for a new Viking stadium. Representative Tom Hepworth brought forth his bill, which would allow the voters to decide if adding slot machines to existing racetracks is a way to generate that revenue for a new facility. Representative Hackbreath joins me in just a moment to give the details of his plan. But first, an encore of a story we first brought you a few weeks ago. John Bruin highlights the new stadiums that have sprung up in the Twin Cities, and he talks with Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commissioner Roy Twilliger on why he feels the need for a new multi-use facility that plays home to the Vikings should be a priority. A national recession and a large state budget deficit means legislators probably don't have an appetite right now for another stadium debate. But sooner or later, it's a subject that will most likely resurface at the state capitol, especially with the Vikings' Metrodome lease set to expire after 2011. 
recess. While there is no current plan or proposal for a renovation of the Metrodome, there is an effort to establish a dialogue with the public about its future. Roy Terwilliger is the chair of the Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commission. The charge of the Sports Commission is twofold. On behalf of the public, we are charged with retaining professional football and baseball in Minnesota. Of course, the baseball team has been taken care of with the new target field. Now our job is to, to, to apply it to the Vikings. The other part of our charge is to oversee the facilities on behalf of the public that's, that is here to make certain that we have, all, have it available for all these other uses by all different types of groups at a price that's affordable to them as well. Just about every day of the year there's something going on here and they're public events, the, the, you know, high school football playoffs, the soccer playoffs, band contests, Hmong New Year, uh, concerts, uh, uh, monster truck jam, uh, tractor pulls, uh, all these various events that are ongoing, NCAA uh, regional tournament this past year. So we end up with a, with a menu of things here that is much, much bigger and broader than just a place for the Vikings to play. Terwilliger says communicating accurate information about the Dome's worth to the community will be a key responsibility of the Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commission. Well, going from here, our, our real charge is to communicate what I'm talking about here to the public, to gain an understanding of this so that they can then unbalance it there and look at, look at, look at what we're going to do with, with the Metrodome. And along that line, then it's up to us to communicate with the policymakers as well as the public at large as to what's going on. And this is not being a cheerleader. This is, in fact, being the resource that's laying out, you know, what the facts are, timetables are, so that people understand as we go forward what actions we need to consider for the policymakers. For now, the future of the Metrodome is unknown. It's likely, however, that before the Vikings lease expires after 2011, Discussions between all of the interested parties will pick up. Representative Tom Hackbarth joins me now to talk more about his initiative. Thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. Thanks for having me. Let's start with your bill. You brought forth a similar one last session, so why bring it forth again? What's changed? Well, this is a little bit different bill. The bill that I brought forth in March of uh, this year, last session, was a constitutional amendment that would allow a privately owned casino to be built in the Seven County metropolitan area and the proceeds that the state would receive on a heavy tax on the profits that that casino would make would be dedicated to building a, a, a Viking stadium. Uh, this is a little bit different. This has to do with uh, our existing race tracks that we have in the state of Minnesota, our horse racing tracks, and allowing them to become racinos, putting slot machines at the, at the horse tracks, and then tax those profits that the racinos make and take those revenues that the state makes and dedicate those funds to building a Viking stadium. A little bit different concept. The idea of a race, you know, has been around for quite some time and it still hasn't generated a whole lot of interest. Why do you think now is the time to bring forth that particular element, that distinction? Well, we have two things going on in the state of Minnesota. We're facing huge budget deficits. Uh, Governor Pawlenty last session took care of the budget deficits. This time we're going to be facing budget deficits again. There's just not any taxpayer dollars to build a new Viking stadium. Uh, I don't think we can bring it forth in a bonding bill. It's a huge amount of money to put in a bonding bill. We're going to have a billion dollar bonding bill the way it is. Uh, adding another billion dollars to that I don't think is going to be uh, something that we're going to be seeing happen. So uh, we need to come up with some innovative thinking. We need some innovative le leadership to get this thing done. The Vikings are going to leave the state of Minnesota. Uh, their contract with the Metrodome runs out after the 2011 season. The time is running out. We have to do something. We need some kind of leadership, a new plan, something different to get the job done, save the Vikings, and it's not going to cost any taxpayer dollars. Why did you want to step forth and be the one to do this, to try to, quote, save the Vikings, as you've said? Well, I've been thinking of a number of different concepts for this for a number of years. Uh, uh, quite a few years ago, I had proposals to build a, a privately owned casinos in the state of Minnesota so that we could do the Twin Stadium, the Gophers Stadium, and the Viking Stadium. Uh, we could have had all of these done by now if we'd have done something like that back then. So I, I tried to come up you know, with different ideas to get this done. This is a little bit different. We're bringing the Racino idea forward that uh, has been proposed in the past. All the legislators know about that. Uh, that bill actually did pass the Minnesota House once. We couldn't get it through the Senate. So there is some momentum there. And, and not only that, uh, my casino idea is 
I, I've been running up against a, a, a group of folks that say that's an expansion of gambling. I don't think the Racino idea is an expansion of gambling because all we're really doing is adding slot machines to an existing facility that already has gambling. We have horse racing there, we have card playing there. That's all taking place already. I think uh, this is not an expansion of gambling. We have the casinos in the state of Minnesota now that are constantly expanding, building on making more room for more slot machines already. That's never considered a, an expansion of gambling. I don't think this is either. Yeah, when you made your announcement earlier in the week, Speaker Kelleher commented after your news conference saying, I think it probably has a very difficult time getting any traction, referencing your bill. It's kind of like a truck on bare ice at this point. What are your thoughts to her words? Well, this is the first I've heard of that. I did not hear that statement. Um, I, I think they're going to have some problem with constituents uh, facing this issue. I think it's a perfect, a perfect way to solve the solution. It doesn't cost any pack taxpayer dollars. Um, how are they going to solve the issue? How are they going to fix the problem? Where is their leadership on this issue? Why don't they do something? Where is their idea? It's a jobs issue. This is, uh, we've already got the Twin Stadium done. We've got the Gopher Stadium done. We need jobs in the state of Minnesota. That's what's going to get this economy moving again. And to do this bill and start building the Viking Stadium would be huge for the state. So are you optimistic you can get a hearing? And if so or if not, what's your next game plan? Well, I, th I think it is uh, uh, possible to get a, a hearing. I don't know how, you know, I, I happen to be a Republican, and, and the Democrats control the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House. I think that uh, they're going to have a hard time facing their constituents when they keep saying, what are we going to do about the Vikings? The Vikings are going to leave. Uh, where is your plan? Where, how are we going to keep the Vikings in the state of Minnesota? The great season that the Vikings are having now, if they go further and maybe even have a chance at uh, going to the Super Bowl, how are they going to uh, deny the constituents of the state of Minnesota a hearing on this bill to get something done? In fact, given that, given the public's um, enthusiasm for the Vikings, particularly right now with Brett Favre on, do you think you... Obviously, that's got to be in your favor a little bit, but do you think it's going to make a difference inside the Capitol building? I think it will when they, they hear that it's not going to cost any taxpayer dollars. Uh, you know, we don't have money to uh, be putting towards a Viking Stadium. I wouldn't vote for a bill that would take taxpayer dollars to put towards a Viking Stadium when we have to balance the budget and we need money for education and health care and those kinds of things. I wouldn't vote for a bill like that that would take tax taxpayer dollars to build a stadium. This is a solution that doesn't take taxpayer dollars to get the job done, and we save the Vikings. Now, how can it be more simple than that to, to solve all of these problems and, and just let this happen? All right, Representative Hackbarth, we're out of time. Thank you, though, Thank for you. your time. The Metro Gang Strike Force is now defunct, and a recent legislative hearing brought forth a compelling exchange as lawmakers questioned why the advisory board that provided oversight to the strike force was still intact. I mean, I don't know how, how we're supposed to have faith in the, in the advisory board that, was, that has been in operation and they're hiring attorneys. Who's this Joe Flynn? We have Corey Land, John Iverson I read about. Are we supposed to trust that they're going to get us out of this mess? Is that what you're telling us? That there's no that 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 we're supposed to just hand this over to the very people who were supposed to be accountable and responsible and have oversight over the Metro Gang Strike Force? Maybe there's not another solution here, but I don't think that this is a good one. And I just have to say that to members of these committees. I just it's it's beyond it's beyond me that these people are still running the show. They aren't running the show. We took all the money away from them. The only function they have now is to try to remedy some of these complaints and some of these suits through through uh, uh, an, app, or an apparatus that's been created. I have been told that we have not the authority to shut down the Metro Gang Strike Force Advisory Board. I understand your frustration. You and I have talked offline about this. I, I, I can't dispute or argue with your your logic, but we uh, don't have the authority to do that. And second of all, if we did, what I said in my, in my presentation is, if we accepted the liability of that, we would open the state up to needless and unnecessary liability that, that, we, that we will, you or the state will end up paying for.
A high-speed rail line from the Twin Cities to Chicago has now gone past the in-the-works phase and has left the station. We sat down with Senator Ann Lynch to get her perspective on why that rail line should run through Rochester and not along the river. Let's talk first of all about this study. It was conducted by a national firm, the Transportation Economics and Management Systems. And as I said, when it compared apples to apples, Rochester took the lead in many different areas. Why do you think your area has the edge here? Well, you know, um, certainly Rochester is an economic hub for um, our region of the state, but I would argue statewide as well with the um, Mayo Clinic being the, the heart of our community. Um, we have the University of Minnesota Rochester. We have a Minsku institution there. So um, I think it's a, it's a strong economic asset for, for the state. And you know, as long as this conversation has been taking place, many lawmakers, myself included, have been arguing that we must have good data from which we can base our decisions. So I'm really pleased to see this come forward. Well, let's talk a little bit about that data. And as I said, the Rochester route, did come out ahead in that data, in that study. However, it would need up to 80 miles of new track and cost about $139 million more than a river route on existing track. Do you think when all is said and done, will the data trump the need for new money? I hope uh, that we are making our policy decisions here in Minnesota uh, and frankly across the country based on good data for policymakers. I think that's really important, but when you look at the the larger question, I think one of the questions we really need to focus on is what really do we want in Minnesota? What really is our vision? And is that vision high speed or is that vision something else? Perhaps commu a commuter um, route, for example. And I think if we can get to the heart of, of answering that question, um, that's going to be really helpful. And what would your answer be, high speed or commuter? Well, I think um, generally people are talking about high speed rail. Um, we know, and this study has further um, helped us to see that um, not all routes are high speed. And when you are trying to um, determine what your long term vision is for your state, when you're looking at things like um, ridership and things like access and return on your investment. Um, I think all of those things play into to that question. And how are you working then as a policymaker with MnDOT to help formulate this plan? Do you have a whole lot of input? Well, you know, um, it was just last session that the legislature directed MnDOT to put together a statewide rail plan. And I will say MnDOT has been very open to um, public comment and suggestions and has been working, um, and they have several committees and forums that they are seeking input from along the way. So I think that that's been a, a really good process. Um, I think that this study um, looked more closely, frankly, at the river route and a Rochester route um, with more detail than MnDOT has um, at its disposal with the current uh, plan that they're putting together. And so given that, why is it so important to your area? Why do you think it's important to air, your area to get this rail line through Rochester as, a, again, opposed to just using existing lines, saving the state yeah. some money? Well, Rochester being the third largest city um, in the state, I think that's one factor. When you look at the economic hub that we have in Rochester, particularly with the Mayo Clinic, um, there are, you know, certainly in southern Minnesota, um, people obtain their medical care there. That's a given. But the fact of the matter is there are hundreds of thousands of people that come into Minnesota every year to obtain their care at that medical destination. And um, certainly looking at high-speed rail, I'm looking at a multi-generational decision. Um, you know, this is, we are at a time in our country where we are um, making decisions about how we're going to, what our rail system is going to look like. And I think that it must be similar to conversations that the policymakers had 50 years ago in the Eisenhower administration when they were putting together the interstate trans you know, transportation system. So I think um, that we're just at a pivotal point um, 
in American history. And this study is relatively new. The process, the directive that MnDOT was given is also relatively new. What's the grand scheme? What's the grand plan? When would you like to see a decision made, tracks in place, and rail going? Well, uh, two things. One, MnDOT's uh, deadline, uh, their report is due to the legislature the end of 2009. So um, I'm look forward to, to receiving that information. Simultaneously, the Obama administration has already um, set aside some $8 billion in federal funds that states all across the country are vying for, um, just like Minnesota. And so um, this study, I think, further supports the work that we're trying to do in, in Minnesota. And we want to certainly be um, at the top of the list. Okay. Senator Lynch, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we'll track this after the report from MnDOT is actually issued. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. There are plenty of committees and hearings that take place here at the Capitol during the interim. To view any of those, just log on to senate.mn slash media. That's going to wrap up this week's Capitol report from all of us at Senate Media Services. I'm Julie Barkey. Thanks for watching.